hello and welcome to Cajun Heat, where we bring traditional Creole and Cajun dishes right to your table. I'm your chef, Josh, and I can't wait to start cooking with you today. So I have traveled and I have tasted my way through Louisiana, building a love and appreciation for the bayou's bold and unique flavors that you can only find in one area. As a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, I chose to hone my skills in the kitchens of Tim Perfontaine and John Besh, learning from the masters of their craft to bring you excellence through my kitchen. During my career in hospitality, I have come to recognize the bond and relationship between cooking with love for your family and friends and how you can develop deeper friendships and a more rejuvenating experience when you share meals together at your table. This sense of hospitality is inherent in Louisiana, where you can be felt in the people's pride of their quality local ingredients and it's only matched by their genuine joy for the pleasure of others. So let's use the bold, unique, and rich flavors of the bayou to bring a taste of Louisiana's culture and history to your table to share with your family and friends. So let's warm up our ovens and get ready to make a bounty. Okay, for our first appetizer that we're gonna be doing today, we're gonna to be doing oysters Rockefeller. So these are Moon Lake oysters. They're nice and creamy. They're really plump once we get them working and it's gonna be delicious. It's gonna go really well with the Parmesan and the spinach and all the other herbs that we're gonna be using. Now, when we wanna prepare our oysters, we wanna do this in advance because it's gonna make it a lot easier for you to serve your table. So dry towel facing you with a oyster knife or you can use a butter knife. I'm gonna show you both ways if you wish. So, Flipping the dry towel down, you can push down, and now you're gonna see this little lever right here. You're gonna to wanna to shimmy this into it, and you're gonna push down, and you're gonna pop it out, and you're gonna hear the pop, okay? So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is get your oyster knife underneath the oyster and scrape the top. When you scrape the top, it's gonna to loosen the oyster, and then you're gonna be able to have a beautiful oyster filet ready to go, and we're gonna do this eight times, and it should be just that fast. So we're treating it like it's alive, and we wanna give it space to do the things that it needs to do. And sometimes you'll get a second pop, and that's perfectly fine. But if you have to, there may be some dirt right here as soon as you get into it. So wipe it off on your dry towel. This way you don't get it inside your oyster. And then shimmy it right here. See how I'm holding it right here? Right here, right across the top. This separates the muscle that this oyster has right here. Okay, so the next part oh, that we're gonna do for the oysters is we're gonna chop all of our vegetables so that we can just put them into the pan and it makes it a lot easier for you to cook. So you can focus on layering in the flavors and then making sure that you're maximizing the amount of flavor you're gonna get from it with the right temperature and the right time of cooking. Okay, so to onions are easy to cut. Cut the tip off right here. And then you're gonna wanna cut the bottom as well. It's gonna make it a flat surface for you. You're gonna take your trash and you're gonna put it into one of your stuff, your pots or a bowl of some sort. It's easier than trying to walk to the trash every single time you try to make a new step for your recipe. To do a nice dice for home cooks, I recommend you go against the side like this instead of going at the other way. Because French chefs like to do that and that's perfectly fine. But for home cooks, we wanna make it a little bit easier because we want to get food on the table, you know? So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna shimmy all the way across, slice one way, and then we're gonna go across the other way, but we're gonna do it on a bias. And if we do it on a bias, we're gonna get a really nice mix, and then we flip it over so it's flat, and then we do it again. And this way, we don't waste any onion, and it's all it's pretty unique, or pretty uniform, you know? So we're gonna move that away to the side, keep all the stuff away from you as you're going, so this way it makes it easier for you to focus on what you're doing. A clean board is gonna be a clear mop, so you wanna make sure that you're all set and you're setting yourself up for success. So, on a bias, you get a nice small dice, and then if you get this little end piece right here, you just rotate it and just cut it again. Easy peasy. And this way we use everything 
because I don't like throwing food into the trash. And especially in New Orleans cooking, we use everything in our food. We don't waste a single thing. Now, I like putting shallots into the Swiss Rocket filler because I think it's a really nice, mellow flavor. But we want to traditionally cut this one because it's a little bit more difficult to cut it on the side if it's not so wide. So, cut the tip off because sometimes these are like the little ends of the, the skins and we don't really want that. So, with your knife, you can shimmy it down. Small slices are going to make it a lot easier for you. And then you just want to do the same cut, just like this. And you have these beautiful diced shallots. We only need about three tablespoons for this recipe, so that's plenty right there. So with garlic, when we're dicing this one, it can be just like the shallot. We're gonna slice it, little dices, rotate it, and then we're going to slice it again that way. And then we're gonna cut it across those lines. And this way you get a nice minced garlic, and we're not crushing it, we're not being mean to it, because garlic is delicious and we wanna be really kind to it, because it's gonna treat us really nice when we put it into the pan. So then we didn't do it for two we got our cloves for this particular recipe. We have all of our vegetables that we're ready to cut for that part of the recipe. Now we're gonna need green vegetables as well, but this is gonna go in after we're done with the sauteing of the onions and the garlic and the shallots, because we wanna put them in layers. The onions go in first, then we put the shallots, and now we put the garlic, because that releases all of the aromas nicely, and we're not gonna overcook any of them. We're gonna get a nice brown color on top of it, and it's gonna be delicious. The next thing that we want to do is make sure we have all of our ingredients ready to go. So when we start cooking on the flame, it's going to be a lot easier for us to make sure that we're moderating our temperature. We're focusing on the actual cooking process, not focusing on cutting vegetables. It's just a lot easier for everybody. So what I recommend is you do a rough chop on some green onions. You're just going to make them all lay the same way. You're just going to do a nice rounding cut, just like this. And we're only going to need about a half cup of green onions. We don't want it to be too strong a flavor for the onions because we already have yellow onions, shallots, garlic, and green onions. And that's just going to overpower the dish. So we just want to be, you know, a little bit more conscientious with the amount of green onions we're going to be using. And this, these ends, don't throw them away. These things, the tips, anything like that, throw into your stock pot, freeze them for later, use them for stock. You'll be thankful that you saved it later. Okay, so for the first thing you're going to do to make sure that you're making the oysters Rockefeller mix is that you're going to need a lot of butter. You're going to put it onto a pan that's going at medium high heat. And after you get the heat going, we're going to let the butter melt. But we can turn it on to high so that we can melt it enough. And then we want to have enough heat so that when we put the onions into it, we're going to get a nice loud sound. Uh, we want to make sure that there's enough heat so that we're going to try to get some brown on top of it. And then we're going to slowly move into the shallots once the onions are starting to release their smells. And then we're going to add the garlic. But we're not going to cook the garlic too long because we don't want to turn it into a different kind of flavor. So melt the butter, allow that to do its thing. And then one of the super cool things that you can do is add spice to the butter. So I want to add maybe a teaspoon of Creole seasoning and then a teaspoon of fresh ground black pepper. And always use fresh ground if you get the opportunity to. Main reason is because it's going to have a lot more volatile oils inside of it. And if you cook pepper or spices inside butter, what's going to end up happening is you're going to release a lot more oils and a lot more flavor into your dishes. This is a little secret that you guys want to use when you're cooking with your family and friends. Okay, so it's almost melted, but we want to let it get a little bit hotter. So when you're going to notice that it's going to start to separate the butter, which is good, it's going to separate the milk fats from the milk solids, and then we're just going to start to add the onions into it once we start to see a little bit more bubbling going, a little bit harder. Okay, so once you start hearing this sound, that's good. It means it's getting hot enough so that the uh, milk fat is starting to ev evaporate. But we want to have a little bit more time and the butter is ready for the onions. It's starting to get a little bit louder. That's good. It's a good sign. Now I think we're getting there. Now we're going to add the onions into it. We've got a little bit of a sizzle. Cool. So putting your onions into it, we're going to cook it for about three to five minutes, depending on the strength of the flame that you have or if you're using an electric stove. Um, but we want to give it enough time and we want to make it so that we're starting to get some color on top of the onions. The moisture is evaporating from the onions. We're starting to get a little bit more color on it and we can smell it starting to come from the pan, but you're also getting the spices, which is really nice. So now goes in the shallots and we're gonna let those cook for just a moment. 
These things don't take too long because they're so small and they have a little bit less moisture than hanging do. So we don't have to let them cook as long. We're going to let this cook for maybe another two minutes. And then once we're done with that, we're going to add the garlic. And then we're going to move a little bit more quickly because we're going to want to take the spinach, which is right over here. And we're going to want to throw it into the pan, but we're going to try to trap the steam that's right here with a lid. And when we do that, it's going to make these things wilt really quickly, and we're going to have a really beautiful color with it. And then after that, we're going to go right into another dish, and we're going to put it into the fridge, and we're going to try to chill it. So it's ready for service, and then we're going to add the Parmesan to it later, so this way the Parmesan doesn't melt and doesn't get all goopy whenever you're trying to add it to something that's hot. So now as we are watching the onions cook with the shallots, you can see that it's still at a nice high temperature and we want to add the garlic to it. Now this is going to get all of the really delicious flavor from the garlic into this dish, but we don't want to cook it too long because garlic has a tendency to burn whenever you don't pay attention to it. So we're going to move a little bit quickly now, but you can already start to smell the garlic releasing its aroma and that is what's going to be really critical to this dish. So we don't want to lose that by overcooking it. We're going to throw the green onions in. These do not take very long to cook. Maybe like 30, maybe 30 seconds or so. And then 30 seconds of waiting and you can smell the wonderful smells that are coming in the kitchen. Grandma's gonna come down and be like, are you cooking? And I'm gonna say, yes I am, absolutely. And then my wife's gonna come over and see what I'm doing. My kids are gonna come through the kitchen and run between my legs or something like that. But you know, we live and we learn and we learn to be really quickly and quick and agile on our feet in the kitchen. And we're gonna add the spinach into the pan. This is about three cups of spinach, but I like to add a little bit more because it's gonna wilt really, really quickly. Um, the first thing you want to do is keep everything in the pan, unlike me, and then we're going to saute it into the, the, the onions a little, we're going to move it into it, try to wilt it a little bit. What we can do is we can start to add the lid to it. You're going to notice that the steam is trapping inside of it, which is going to help wilt the spinach quicker, and it's going to get a nice pretty green color, because when we cook with water with green vegetables, we're allowing water to go into the cell walls and then it reflects light nicer, so it actually turns into a prettier green for us at the table. So we want to make sure that we're treating our vegetables nice and then we're going to have a really nice dish towards the end of the night. Now it's going to continue to cook a little bit, so we don't need to do too much to it right now. Now you can see that it's been wilted, we have some nice color on our onions, and we're going to add parsley, it's been roughly chopped. This doesn't take too long to cook. And this is going to add a little bit more body to the spinach because spinach just tastes kind of like earthy. But we want to add some herbalness to it so it tastes nice and it's a different kind of dish. The next thing that we're going to do after the spinach, because this ingredient does not take very long to cook, um, we're going to add tarragon. But another thing that you need to remember is we're always going to be adding salt as we go into the recipe because we're building up on the flavors. We're trying to pull flavors out of this and we're trying to treat it really nice. So now, Tarragon goes inside of this. Now tarragon's got a really interesting flavor. It's an anise flavor, almost like licorice, but it's much more mellow and very floral. So it's gonna taste really, really good with Parmesan and oysters. So that's all you need to do right there. We're gonna take it away from the heat, turn off the heat, make sure you don't leave it on because if you have kids running around, that's dangerous. So as it's still hot, we want to take it and we want to put it into a container and we're going to put it into the fridge. The reason we're going to do that is it's going to try to preserve the color and it's going to look really nice when we're done trying to prepare the dish and then we broil the spinach. Okay, so remember, hot, dry towels with hot pans because if you have any water on this and it was a hot handle or if it's a metal handle and you steam your hand, you're not going to have a nice day in the kitchen. So our spinach is chilled for enough so that we can handle it and we're going to throw cheese into it. It is, It can be lukewarm, which is perfectly fine. So we take shredded Parmesan cheese and make sure you get the good stuff with the uh, blistered edges and you can tell that it's got a hard rind on top. Don't throw this away when you're done with it. You can use it for something else. Throw it into your stock, make a nice uh, ragu out of it. That would be delicious. So we're going to add three-fourths a cup of Parmesan to this, but we want to pack it down so we know that we're adding enough cheese. Oysters Rockefeller is all about the cheese. Okay. So if we do that, we're gonna make sure we got a really, really flavorful mix because it's gotta go as soon as you taste it. It can't be something that's like, ooh, this is, you know, this is nice and mellow. We wanna have something that is more like a rock concert as soon as we start trying to eat it. Now, once it's been mixed up, there's no bread breadcrumbs, there's nothing else that we're going into it, but you can taste it and make sure that it's got the seasoning that we want with it, which is good because we taste as we go. 
And you don't use the same spoon because we don't want to gross out our guests. But this is delicious, and we're gonna put it back into the fridge. So when we're ready for it, it's gonna be ready for our oysters. Okay, so the last part that we're gonna have to do to finish the oysters Rockefeller is we're gonna have to prepare some panko breadcrumbs, and then we're also gonna slice a little bit of a lemon, and we're gonna finish it into this. The reason we're gonna wait till it's colder is because we wanna keep the lemon as fresh as possible, so it's gonna taste much more vibrant. Now, as we're slicing the lemon, uh, I already pre-rolled this, so like whenever you get a hard lemon, just roll it down and you really get your hands into it, and you're gonna notice it's gonna loosen up. And you're gonna get a lot more juice from your lemon, which is awesome, because more lemon juice is better. So we're only gonna need one half of a lemon for this, okay? Nothing crazy. So take this and use it for something else. Make yourself some lemonade. I like to slice that and put it into some water and give it to my wife. It always is a nice surprise. Just shows, shows her that I love her. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna finish our breadcrumbs. We're gonna take a nice healthy pinch of salt, and then we're gonna take another healthy pinch of black pepper. Remember, fresh ground, much, much, much more flavorful. And then we're gonna mix it into it, dry ingredients first, because if you don't mix it, if you mix dry ingredients with oil and then put your spices into it, you're gonna get clumps of it and it's not gonna be completely homogenous or even. So now we're gonna take a couple tablespoons, maybe three tablespoons, maybe four tablespoons of olive oil because we really wanna wet these. Now the reason that we're trying to wet them is because panko breadcrumbs has a lot of air inside of it. But when we fill it up with oil and then we put it into the broiler, what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna get really beautiful, like golden brown, delicious breadcrumbs. So whenever we start looking at it, it looks like it's a little bit drier, but add some more oil. It's no big deal. I mean, we're eating oysters Rockefeller. Do we really care about calories right now? No, and that's fine. Who would want to do that when you're trying to celebrate or like do something special for your guests? So now it's starting to look like it's got a little bit more of a saturation point, which is good. So you're gonna notice a change in color, okay? That's the most important part. So once that's finished, we're gonna have our broiler be ready for us, and it's, this is gonna have to happen right before we serve. Okay, so all the other dishes are gonna be ready, and then bring the oysters right after, okay? I like to serve family style personally, and the reason is is because I mean, we're sitting, we're trying to enjoy each other's food company, and we have all the food ready, it's gonna be so much easier to just sit back and enjoy the fruits of your labor, you know? So. Here's a trick. I like to serve things in dishes that are oven safe, but then are able to be transported right to the table. So what we're gonna do to prepare the oysters is we're gonna move it from our pan. I put salt onto it because I didn't want them to shift and we didn't want to lose any of the delicious brininess that they have. But we're gonna put it into another pan full of salt. And the reason we're putting it into salt, I mean, if you don't have like um, the amount of salt that I have, that's perfectly fine. You could use red beans, you could do rice, you could do black beans. Dried is fine, don't do the wet ones, that would be silly. But those are just gonna be, you know, it's it's something that you don't mind losing and it's cheap, okay? So the next thing that we do is we remove away the salt so we can start focusing on adding the goodness to the oysters. I like using a spoon. And we're gonna wanna put a healthy dose. And we're gonna make sure it's nice and homogenous. So it's really well mixed. Okay, healthy dose, okay? And when we're putting it into it, try to fill it. We want to be stingy with this because this is going to be the best part. It's just delicious and everybody's going to want more of it. There's never going to be enough and I'm perfectly okay with it. So if you think that people are going to love it, make extra, shuck some more. Have some. Have a second batch ready to go. But plan ahead and with the, it's just going to make it so that you're way, way more successful at anything that you're going to be hosting or if you're going to be doing something for a special evening with your wife or your significant other, you do that. As we're preparing these oysters, you can see that they have a nice amount of filling. They're not shifting in the pan, which is fantastic, because when we're moving them in and out of the broiler to make sure that everything's working or that they're getting even uh, even heat and that they're gonna have the breadcrumbs on top of it, we just wanna make sure that they're, it's not gonna be any more difficult than this, because you're gonna be bending over, you're gonna be taking it back up and you're gonna look at it. Now remember, before you start broiling, you always wanna have at least two towels right next to it that are not wet. And the reason is, because again, steam into the hands really hurts. My hands hurt sometimes when I do that, and I don't want to do that, but I have a lot of scars because I've worked in restaurants for 15 years, but let's not do that, okay? I want to spare you some pain. So as we add the breadcrumbs to the oysters, we want to evenly layer it. You're going to be making way more breadcrumbs than you're going to need, so don't feel bad about going a little extra on it, and we can always save those for something else. They should be good for a couple days.
Okay, so we should be ready to be able to move this into the broiler. It's been preheated for at least 20 minutes. We want to make sure that the heat is hot enough so that it's going to broil it, it's going to cook it, and we're going to get a nice golden brown on top of the top of these oysters. Now, the golden brown is what we're searching for. Um, remember that broilers are your fickle friends, okay? If you turn around for more than one second sometimes, it's enough to burn everything, so we want to be very conscientious and ready. I like to hold a towel to remind myself that I have something in the broiler because I have people running in and out of my kitchen and it just makes it a lot easier for me. So if I, you know, if I don't know what to do with my hands, I put it right here. <laughs> I'm not going to forget. So we're going to move it over to the broiler, open it up, and then put it directly into the top shelf. So that now the oysters are inside the oven and we want to be very careful with what we're doing. We want to set ourselves up for success. So I'm standing next to it because I don't want to burn it towels in hand, but we're going to sit here and we'll wait. It's going to be about 30 seconds to about a minute, and then we're going to add golden brown, delicious looking breadcrumbs on top of it, and everything's going to be nice and warm, and then we're going to have some delicious oysters drop the film. So let's just take a moment and wait. And guess what? It's almost time to take them out already. It's been about 30 seconds, and I'm ready to go. Now, if you notice that at the back part of the oysters aren't getting cooked, you can rotate your pan and just give it another couple moments. But remember, it's gonna be a lot faster this time, so just be patient. There we go. I like to close my oven because my children like to run right between it and I just don't want to have any kind of issues. But now, we can serve this directly to our guests right at the table as long as we put some sort of towel or uh, coaster underneath it because this is going to be hot and we don't want to damage our tables. So, towel, and it's hot so we want to be careful. But we want to move it over here and then this way we don't damage our countertops. And this way it's all set and ready to go for our guests and this way we can start moving all the other food out to the table as well. So the second dish that we're going to be making for our main course is going to be redfish train. So it's going to have a crispy filet of skin on fish, and then we're going to have cauliflower puree on the bottom of it, and we're going to have lump crab meat from blue crabs, as well as the claw meat and then the lump part. The reason is because it's going to be a little bit sweeter, but then the flake meats you're going to get from the jumbo lump crab uh, nuggets are going to be really delicious with it. And the next thing that we're going to do to finish that entire dish off is we're going to make a brown butter sauce. So you can use a whole slew of varieties of different kinds of fish, but you want to make sure that it's going to be a medium activity fish and it doesn't have like a super fatty skin and we want to make sure that it's been scaled, we want to make sure that it's been pin boned and it's been filleted for you. So make sure you ask your fish person or your butcher to make sure that they take the fillets off and then they pin bone it, but make sure that you double check because sometimes they forget to do the pin bones. It's kind of tedious and people don't want to do it. So just fair warning. Now, I've already prepared one of these fillets, but I wanted to show you this particular one. Uh, this one, what we do with fish to make sure that we get a super crispy crust is that we let it sit on a plate in the refrigerator for at least an hour. What it's going to do is it's going to tack the skin, and you're going to lose a lot of moisture from the coldness in your refrigerator because it's moving air. But there's a second thing that we're going to do, and we have to have a paper towel, and we're going to have a semi-sharp knife. I got to use this one for a lot of stuff. It's pretty sharp, but you can use a dull one just to be safe. So, blade across, right? and drag as far as you can like this. Now, if you can see this right here, that's extra water we're trying to take out of the skin of the fish. And it's just gonna make it so it's gonna be really crispy. Now you're gonna do it a few times, and you're gonna be very gentle. We don't wanna damage the fillet. We're just trying to get some extra, the extra moisture off of it, you know? We can tie it up, so like, see how there's like a little bit of a cut right here? We can make it look nice, just like that. And then it's done. It goes right into the trash, and then we're ready to serve this. Now, when we wanna, Keep these cold up till service. So the best thing to do is you can use the same towels that you have right here. Just flip them onto another side. And we'll just tap this down to make sure that they're extremely dry. You'll see that I already found some more moisture right here. Okay, now this is done. We don't have to use these things. These things can go into the garbage, but they can go right back into the fridge. So the next thing that we need to do when we're making redfish train, again, we have to prepare all of our ingredients before we try to put any heat to it. We gotta ready up this lump crab. Now it comes pre-shelled, which is good, but we don't wanna trust everybody to do their job. I mean, it's mainly robotically separated anyways. So we wanna just double check. 
So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna grab each one of these nuggets and you're gonna feel it gently with your skin, with your hands. And you'll notice when a, a, a piece of crab shell is gonna stick out, it's gonna have a different kind of color and it's gonna be hard. It'll feel like a sharp pebble. But we just wanna make sure we're not giving any of our guests at the table a rock, because that's what it tastes like. And that's not very fun. Um, but it's gonna give me peace of mind and I like to have peace of mind whenever I'm cooking. Cooking's supposed to be fun. We're supposed to like enjoy the process of doing this and you know making something delicious and showing that we loved our guests. It's like, hey, I want to make you guys have a good time when you come here and that you're in good hands when you come to my house. And you're gonna be surprised every time when you come because I want you guys to have dishes and things that you've never experienced before or maybe you haven't had before. So we picked through all of our crab. We made sure that we don't have any of the shell fragments or anything inside of it. I feel safe about this. There's no issue with it. We're gonna set it down right here and we're just gonna come back to it a little bit later. Keep it in your fridge. We wanna make sure that we're always keeping it out of a temperature danger zone so we don't get anybody sick. And I don't wanna have that happen. And you guys don't want that either. It's a big hassle. Uh, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna start preparing our cauliflower. So what I recommend is you get a big piece of cauliflower, but you're not gonna need this entire thing for this recipe. We don't need a whole lot of cauliflower here, right? Um, but we're gonna cut it in half. You're gonna see where the stem stops and take your knife and go right here to where the stem meets the actual good part of the cauliflower. And you can just take this out all by itself, super easy. No trouble whatsoever. So I like to use cauliflower in a lot of my food. Um, so whenever I'm making cauliflower at home, I buy a nice big head and I have this for vegetable stir fries or I do other things with it just to make sure that I'm not wasting any ingredients. So when we're prepping the cauliflower, I like to make it so that we start with little steaks. Now, if you can't do this very safely, it, that's why we're doing it this way. Because this way we can dice it and we can make it so that it's all uniform. So when we're boiling it or when we're simmering it inside the frame mixture with the garlic and the parmesan that we're going to use because we saved that brine from the previous myth dish, which was the oyster rock filler. This way we utilize all of our ingredients and we're getting something that is going to have a lot of umami or the, the fifth sense of the tuna like when you're tasting something. It's depth on your palate, it's weight on your palate, and something that you really can't, it's, it's difficult to make, so we don't want to waste the opportunity to use that. Okay, so now we have our cauliflower nice and prepped. This is about two cups of cauliflower, to be good. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to move this into a separate pan and get it nice and clean and then we're going to move to cutting our shallots and then our butter. So for the next component of our redfish poncha train, we're going to make a cauliflower puree. We're going to have shallots, garlic, and we're going to use a extra ingredient that we use from the oysters Rockefeller and we're going to use the Parmesan rind. So while we're simmering this with the heavy cream and having some stock handy, just in case that we need to refill the uh, cauliflower a little bit more and get some more moisture into it, it's just going to be ready. And then we're also going to prepare a little bit more for the next part of the red dish for the redfish. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to mince a shallot and we're going to save some of it so that we can use it for the brown butter sauce so that we can fortify that with some shallot, some garlic, and make it taste delicious, you know? So then remember when we're going across, we're shimming it, we're not trying to slice down or any crazy way. Now as you're doing this, I like to go super, super slow because I don't want to cut off the tops of my knuckles. I've worked in kitchens for quite a long time and I've lost a couple knuckle tips. So let's not do that for you guys. Be nice and slow. Don't feel like you have to try to rush or race, okay? You only need about a tablespoon of shallots, okay? So a tablespoon of shallots puts it into a separate container and we're gonna fold that for our sauce later. So to prepare a Parmesan a rind, the best thing to do is to lay it as flat as you can. If I try to cut it like this, that is just asking for danger, okay? So slice it down, cut it halfway, and then start on the other side. See, I only went halfway. And then you find that little incision you made and cut that down right there. This is totally good Parmesan. You can use this for anything. You can use it for pasta, use it for another dish layer. But this guy right here, you can't eat this. This is hard, it's, it's yeah, you don't want, it's too tough. So what we want to do is we want to simmer it with our cauliflower. And when it's sitting inside cream, and then we have a little bit of stock, and we layer these flavors, it's gonna have a really great depth layer, okay? So we're gonna do a couple cloves of garlic, because, actually, let's do three cloves of garlic. And the reason we're doing three cloves of garlic is because cauliflower doesn't have a whole lot of flavor, 
but we want to really try to put as much of it as we possibly can into it while we're making it, you know? And don't forget, like, we're making a puree, okay? When we're making a puree, the, the, you don't have to be extremely precise with your cuts. The reason is, is because you're going to be blending it anyways. It's going to be super tender. We're going to use a stick blender. We're going to make it nice and creamy. Um, but the fiber of what the, is inside the cauliflower is what's going to give it its body and its meat, you know? So let's clear up our board again. So into another receptacle. It's ready to go when we want to start putting fire to the food, okay? It's called mise en place everything in its place. Make sure you're doing that. It's gonna make your life a lot easier and it's gonna make cooking much more enjoyable, okay? So, we're gonna head over to the stove and start making this. Okay, so when we're gonna make the cauliflower puree, the first thing we wanna do is turn on the heat, get it up to a nice high heat, is we're gonna melt our butter, and then we're gonna add our shallots and our garlic first, and then we add our cauliflower. Uh, the main reason is because these things, we wanna make sure that there's not a lot of the harshness that's with the, sh the shallots first, and then we wanna come in and add our main ingredient to it. And it's just gonna make it so it's a much more lavish dish, and it's gonna have more richness, and it's gonna be more flavorful. Now, we are using a nice half stick of butter in this because we wanna add a lot of fat. The, the, the creaminess of the cauliflower puree is gonna come from the fats and then the, the suspension of the fibers from the cauliflower with the fats mixed with it with all the flavorable compounds that go into those fats like thyme with a little bit of black pepper and some extra salt uh, but we're gonna let this melt and then we're gonna start cooking okay so our butter is melted the pan is hot and now we're gonna add our shallots Got a nice sound coming from that, which is good. Use a wooden spoon when you're coming with this because we're using a non-stick pan, which that's the one I have right now. We don't want to scrape the bottom because it releases the chemicals and the toxins into our cooker. That's not cooking with us, we're not going to do that. Now we add our garlic because we have shallots cooked quite quickly in hot oil, and we want to just make sure that we're shimming them around so that we aren't creating any burn spots or any of like the little black flakes that'll happen when we're trying to uh, make a nice puree. And then once we start to get the smell coming from it, because it's starting to smell like really delicious garlic and shallots, that's when we're gonna add the cauliflower. Now they're all uniform on purpose because we want them to cook evenly. And then this way we can judge that all of the pieces are gonna be roughly about the same before we try to puree them. Because if we try to puree them when they're not completely finished, we're gonna get a chunky puree. And that's not very fun, because it's not a puree, it's more of a chunky soup than that. And we don't want that. So we're gonna cook our cauliflower for at least five minutes. We'll see how that goes, but I think it may actually need a little bit more time. So we're gonna cook it up maybe around eight minutes at that point in time. It's gonna start feeling a little bit more tender, but that's when we're gonna influence, uh, put our cream into it. And then we're going to accent that cream with a couple sprigs of thyme and then our Parmesan rind because we don't waste anything in this kitchen, right? So we wanna add as much flavor to this dish as possible. Okay, so the next thing that we're doing after we let the cauliflower cook a little bit more is we notice that we're gonna start getting a little bit more caramelization around on the outsides of the onions and then the cauliflower bits, which is really good because you're not gonna notice that very much when we add two cups of cream to it. That's perfectly fine. So once this is hot, which is good, we're gonna take the thyme sprigs, we're gonna throw it into it and we're gonna try to get these a little bit warmed up. We're gonna try to get some more fats on top of them. I like to try to get them almost like fried up because it just accents the dish a little bit more. It doesn't need a whole lot of time. Fresh herbs really don't take very much. Like, if you were using like dried thyme, which I don't recommend for this recipe because it would have a completely different flavor, um, they take a lot longer to infuse into a dish. So you, you can add them at the beginning of your stages of cooking, but with this one in particular, since it's fresh, you wanna add it at, at the very end. So now we're gonna add a pint of cream. And this is where all the love comes into it because I fat is flavor. And it's something that I really enjoy because it just brings us to the next level, right? Now we're gonna take this Parmesan rind and we're gonna put it right here in the center. And we're just gonna let it do its thing. It's gonna sit there and simmer. We're gonna add a nice pinch of salt to it. Maybe another one, I think another one for that. And while we're waiting for this to simmer, what's gonna end up happening is it's gonna reduce and then it's gonna intensify the flavor. And then once this is about halfway down, we're gonna see if it needs any more cooking. If it's super tender, great. If it isn't, that's when we take the, the stock right here. This is actually made in-house because we have all of those things that we saved in the freezer with the bones and stuff that we make from the other, the other shows. So this way, we don't waste anything. So we're gonna give this about five minutes to see how it looks after it's been simmering for a bit. But don't forget to lower your heat because we don't wanna burn it. 
okay? It only needs to be on like a nice low simmer. And this could be going while we're prepping the other parts of this dish. Now when it comes to great fish with crispy skin, this is the easiest thing that you gotta do. The pan has to be hot before you put in your oil because we wanna get our oil right up to that smoking point where it's shimmering a little bit. And the reason we look at it, you're gonna see that it has like these ripple effects once we start to shake it. It just means that the oil is loosened up and it's ready to be uh, used to turn this into a nice crispy fish fillet. Now we wanna have a pan that's big enough for two fillets and it's gonna be able to make sure that it has enough heat to transfer into the skin to evaporate whatever water's left from here after we left it in the fridge for an hour and then we also scraped off the extra uh, water and we took that off with a paper towel. And now we're gonna do yet another thing to make sure that we're gonna have crispy skin. We're gonna take a disposable paper towel and we're gonna lay it right here on top of the fish and because it was sitting in the fridge, it could have a little bit of condensation and we don't want any condensation at all. And the reason we don't want that is because it's gonna create something called a steaming effect in the center part of the filet. And we're gonna use another trick that I know to make sure that the center plate always touches this, the pan. And once that releases its ability to pull in, it's gonna have a nice, crispy, flat fish filet, okay? So, over high heat, this is already pretty warm, so we're just gonna make sure that it's really, really hot. And as soon as I start to feel like it's getting to that point where it's extremely hot, that's where we're gonna add at least two tablespoons of oil. We're gonna move it around in the pan because we want the entire pan to be lubricated with the, the oil before we put the fish plates into it, okay? Now, just another couple moments, and I'm starting to see a little bit of the smoke from the pan, that's okay. So two tablespoons, shimmer it. And the reason we're doing this is it's gonna heat the oil up really quickly, okay? Now that just got a little bit of the heat from the pan, we're gonna give it another couple seconds. And I'm gonna try to get the shimmer effect. I wish I could show it a little bit easier, but the shimmer effect is when you drag it to the top part of right here and you pull it down, and you're gonna see it's like loose water or like water that grips, which is really neat. Um, but thick oil doesn't do that, so when it's really hot and it gets loose, you're gonna notice that it's doing that, okay? That's when we know the pan is almost ready. We wanna do this safely, right? Because if we don't do this safely, it's gonna, we're just gonna get hurt, and that's no fun. I want to make sure everybody's being safe in the kitchen. So, fish fillet tail, right, skin side down, because this is the presentation side. And what we're going to do is we're going to remove the oil and try to put it into that where right it is right there. So you see how I'm holding this down right here in the center? I'm trying to make sure that the center part is touching the bottom of the pan, because as soon as you put it into a high heat environment, the skin wants to pull in and then push up. So we don't want that to happen. And you gotta be kind of firm with this. Don't be afraid to let it know that you lose boss, right? And if you need two, you need two. This is a big play, right? So we're just gonna hold it right here. And we're gonna notice that it's gonna start to give a little bit. It's not ready for that just yet. Oh, wait, it just happened. Do you see that? It stopped trying to pull up towards the center. So now we know that it's gonna be nice and crispy right here on the bottom. There's not gonna be any steam on the bottom part of the center of the filet. And now we can move that filet off. And then we're gonna get ready to do the same thing here. So remember, we want to lay it away, so I shake the fillet to the other side, and we're going to do head down so the tail comes back, and we're going to go right into the oil, laying it away from you, and we're going to immediately go with, uh, these are big fillets, so we need to use two different things to put enough pressure down on it, but we're not trying to push and turn it into a mash, because fish is really delicate, and we don't want to hurt it. We want to make sure it looks really pretty when it comes onto the plate. And be careful because sometimes it comes on the other side of the pan and it can kind of burn you or make it really uncomfortable to hold it. So this is really good and I'm excited about this in particular. Okay, so don't be afraid to take a look and see where everything's going. You know? It still needs a little bit more time on this and that's okay. Now, when you're cooking fish, something that's important for you to know, the outsides are gonna cook pretty quickly, but the center part is where we're gonna try to make sure that we get the perfect doneness, okay? So you're gonna notice a color change with fish first, then there's a flakiness that happens with it, and then we're gonna make sure that our skin is extremely crispy. Now with this particular recipe, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna go right into an oven, okay? As soon as we flip this and we know that the skin is nice and crispy, then we wanna take that brown, that butter right there and put it into it and then put it into the oven on a convection set. Because then it's moving the moisture that's coming from the butter away from the fish and all around this environment. It's gonna finish cooking our fish and then we're gonna have the ability to brown that butter after we're done and that's gonna become our sauce, okay? So 
I'm going to use a second spatula. I'm going to flip it gently and move it over to the side. And see how we got a nice caramelization around there? There's cooking, it's getting crisp right here in the center. That's a very good sign. It means we did it correctly. And now we're going to be gentle with it. Flip it over. Oh, look at that. We have wonderful color. I love it. This is going to be so good. So then now, what we're going to do is we're going to use the same fish sauce here, because we want to hold them carefully while we do this. I'm going to try to drain some of this extra fat away, okay? I don't want this to be part of the dish. It has a bunch of fish oil on it from the skin. So, see how nice and gentle I was with the fish? We didn't do anything. I didn't break any of it. The fillet looks good. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to add shallots because this is going to turn into our sauce. We got one little knob of garlic because we don't want it to burn, okay? So why would we put a small piece of garlic into it in a hot oven and a hot pan if we don't want it to burn when we just want the flavor of it, right? And then, to make sure that we're doing something a little bit extra, we're going to throw some lemon peels, and then we're going to make the buttermilk too, okay? Now, understand, the fish is going to be done before the sauce is, and that's okay. So we're going to shimmy this around. A little trick that I learned is that we can move the fish fillet like this. And we're going to be very gentle when we're taking it out. We're going to move it away. Now this is just to get it off the pan and into something else because we will have a little bit of mass. We only have so much space while we're over here. Everybody's kitchen is different. So look at how pretty this looks. This is fantastic. Now if you want to keep it nice and beautiful, I recommend you set this on top of a sheet tray with a little bit of a wire rack. And what's going to happen is it's going to make it so that the air gets underneath it and you're not going to get soggy fish. So I'm going to do that right now. Now our sauce is finished. We've got the shallots nice and cooked. The garlic looks nice. We have the lemon peel. We have a nice smell coming from it right there. And what I always like to have in my kitchen is a small sieve. This is just going to separate all of those things that we put into it so you can pick through it because that's not fun. I mean, that's not fun, man. We don't, we're not going to do that. So we're going to be smart about how we cook and it's going to make our lives a lot easier, okay? So now I have a perfectly finished sauce right there. I can just throw this into the trash or wherever you think that you need it. But this is going to be our sauce for our fish and it's pretty fatty so we don't really want to go nuts with it but we're going to finish it with some extra lemon a little bit later when we bring it back up to temperature but when you notice that brown butter is finished is you're going to start to get a really nice nutty flavor from it but you have to move quickly because the milk solids are the things that are caramelizing inside of it but if you like go too hot they're going to turn black and it's not a nice sauce so we're not going to put that onto our fish but this is going to be delicious and i'm very excited for you guys to see it once it's finished Okay, so our cauliflower is now nice and tender and it's been reduced down. We're gonna be able to turn it into a beautiful puree. Um, it looks wonderful, it smells delicious because remember we put the Parmesan rind into it. So when we're smelling it, we're getting like the essence of cheese, we're getting thyme, we're getting garlic, we're getting shallots. There's a lot more flavor in here than just cauliflower and I'm really happy about that. Now, before we blend things, obviously we wanna make sure that the stuff that we don't want inside our puree is out, such as these woody thyme sprigs. They taste great but not in your mouth. <laughs> like you want them in the, you want them in the pot and that's it. You're gonna leave some thyme leaves in here. That's not a big deal. Don't worry about that at all, okay? You wanna scrape down the sides a little bit to make sure that we're getting all the goodness off the side. You can just angle the liquid over here and it just comes right off. It just tastes good. That's called Maillard reaction. We don't want to throw any of that away. It's going to make everything much more flavorful. We have our handy dandy homemade stock that we made with all of our frozen vegetables and things that we don't want to use and things that we don't want to throw away, okay? So that's sitting there. It's just, it's ready to fire when we need it. So before we start blending, we want to make sure that we know how to blend correctly because we want to make it nice and smooth, but we want to set it up so that we are going to allow the tool to do its job. And the reason we're going to do that is we're going to angle our pan or, or pot down this way. We're gonna make, make a nice little pool down here. And what's gonna end up happening is when we start blending it, it's not gonna spit everywhere. It's gonna have it, the ability for it to flow through. Now, if it's not making enough uh, puree or if it's not going quick enough, that's where we add our stock. Okay, but we don't do it until then because we want an intense flavor. We want flavors to go BAM inside your mouth. We don't want things to kind of be like mellow, you know? So let's not do that. Okay, it's gonna get a little loud and you warn everybody before anything happens, right? Now, as you continue to do the puree, it's going to look more and more smooth. Don't be afraid to shimmy it down. It's show it who's boss, right? Okay, 
don't like to shake it off before I do anything else with this because I don't want to make a big mess. And the easiest thing to do is to use the same dish that we had so we don't have to wash any more of them. I don't want to create any more messes. I don't want to make any more drips. I don't want to make sure everything's nice and clean. So I like to have a place where I can set and use utensils or things that I don't need anymore. It keeps my counters clean. It keeps my cutting board nice and uh, clear. And it keeps my mind sharp, right? Because if we cook like chefs, the food's going to taste like it gorgeous cauliflower puree that we have right now. So my favorite way to tell whether or not the cauliflower puree is thick enough is if I take a wooden spoon and I drag it right through it. It should very slowly try to close that gap, okay? It means it's thick enough, and when we try to plate it, and we're gonna make a nice little swoosh that goes underneath our fish, and then we put the crab on top of it, and we pour our brown butter. It's just gonna be really simple, elegant, and wonderful, and everybody's gonna rave about it. Especially if you cook it for your friends. I mean, everybody's gonna try to come to your house. It's delicious. Okay, so we're gonna set this aside um, for service, okay? So the last thing that we gotta do to make redfish ponchatrain is we gotta make crab delicious. But it's already delicious, so we wanna make it more delicious. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take some butter into a hot. We're gonna melt it, get a nice sound. Oh, that sounds good, that's exactly what I want. I like that sound. That means it's gonna melt really quickly, and that means I can throw a couple cloves of garlic into it accent the smell and get that butter right there on the side of that pan. So you see how we're making a little pool right here? This is gonna be really good for the oil because we want to accent this oil with the garlic. We can actually even throw some pepper into it. Let's do that. Look at that, we got pepper in it as well. This is gonna get those oils going. It's gonna make it nice and delicious and it's foaming up good, excellent. So once we're done with that, here we have our crab. It goes right on in. We're gonna be very gentle with this crab but we want to throw tarragon into it as well. Now, being quick with this process is extremely important because this is the final component of the dish that we're trying to make. Do you see how gentle I'm being? I'm barely flipping this. I see any new small pieces, and then we take out the garlic because we don't want to give the garlic to people that we're serving. That would be interesting. Well, maybe the people you don't like do that. Okay, so. We got this beautiful looking crab. Moving it from the pan into this, we want to be very careful with it because we don't want to damage it. We want a nice big fat chunks of crab, see? So when we want to have the crab be hot for service, what I like to do is to preheat the container I'm going to put the crab into. It's not going to overcook it. We just have it in for a little bit and it's going to make it so you have a little bit more time before you have to actually plate and it's going to keep the food hot and we're going to serve hot food hot and we're going to serve cold food cold, right? Sounds good, let's plate. So now we're gonna plate our redfish poncha train and it's gonna look really nice on this cute little plate that I have. We have our warm cauliflower puree, we have our crab that we have cooked in butter and added some tarragon for a little bit of color, and then we have our brown butter sauce as well as a safe place to put a crispy fish and make it so that it stays nice and crispy. So we wanna get it to the table the way that it's meant to be, right? Now before we start plating, we wanna make sure that our plate is hot, okay? So just let it sit there for about 15 seconds. It's gonna be great, and just make sure that you have a towel to make sure that when you take that plate out, you're not going to burn your hand, okay? okay. Make sure you're using a dry towel. I can't ex express that enough, all right? So the first thing we want to do whenever we're plating anything is think about what we want it to look like. So we want to build up and add a little bit of height. Now, puree doesn't have a lot of height. That's okay, it's got a lot of flavor. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a small smidge right here, and we're just gonna go, and it's gonna be nice. But I want more than that. Okay, so then I want more than that, right? There we go. I'm serving for me too. I wanna eat, I'm hungry. So on a bias, you can leave the fish right here, and then you can take the spoon right here that we have here, and we're just gonna dra drape this crab right here on the top of this fish right here. Now, I like to have a healthy, healthy portion of crab, okay? I don't wanna feel like I'm being stingy towards my guests, and I wanna feel like everybody's definitely got all the work that I put into this dish, you know? Because it just makes it so much better. Now, with the brown butter sauce, give it a nice little stir, get some of those brown butter solids that you see right here, and it looks nice. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take the spoon, we're gonna put a little bit on the crab, and we're gonna go right around the edges, okay? What's not to like about breadfish poncha train? Well, there's nothing because it's a very simple dish. It's got all of the ingredients that we have in the house. We utilize everything that we could possibly do to make cauliflower taste good. We have garlic, shallot, Parmesan rind. It's gonna be nice. And then we treated our fish properly. We got it nice and 
dry before we put it into a pan. So this way we had success ready. And then we held it down correctly. Who would have thought that you wanted to hold down a fish before you know we actually turned around from it? And that's probably why a lot of fish fillets are just steamed and not very good. But then we have this crab, and this crab is delicious. It's blue crab. How can we be disappointed with that? It's actually sweet. It's wonderful. So then when we have that and we finally get to the point where we're going to finish it off with a nice butter sauce to add some extra richness to the dish, we have a brown butter sauce, which is brown milk proteins with butter. And then we add a little bit of lemon to it and we're going to put it on top of it and we just drizzle it nice. So then it looks great. And then we get to serve to our guests. So I'm going to go do that right now. Okay, so for our third dish, we can relax a little bit. Beignets are pretty easy. They're a very, very basic thing to make, but it's just fried donuts, okay? But we wanna make them special, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make blueberry beignets. And to make that really good, what we wanna do is do something that most people don't do with their blueberries when they make beignets, is we take a little bit of sugar, right? Let's do two teaspoons, okay? And then we're gonna take all of our blueberries. It goes right into this pan. And then we're gonna take a fork and we're gonna mash them as much as we possibly can. Okay, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna expel all of their juices. It's gonna release a lot of the pigments. It's gonna make it so that it's gonna turn some of our dough nice and purple or a slight blue, you know? So to do that, it just requires a little bit of elbow grease. If you wanna make sure that you're getting good blueberries, this is really important for you to understand. If you look at the little white layer that this blueberry has as I wipe it away, that's a really good sign. So you get blueberries that have that. And if they're heavy, like if they feel heavy for their weight, it means they have a lot of water inside of it. It's gonna make it much more flavorful blueberry. Just a little tidbit of uh, trivia if you wanna have that and know what you're looking for when you go to a grocery store. So once it's all nice and mixed up, we mix in that sugar all the way around with it, and it's just gonna sit there and macerate for a moment. We don't have to let this sit too long. It's already been smashed. We're just gonna do more stuff to it. So we're gonna take eggs and add it directly to this because now this is gonna become our wet mix. So what's cool about making your wet mixture in one pan and keeping your dry ingredients in another is it's gonna make it very easy for you to clean up after yourself and it's gonna keep you following the recipe. To our dry mixture, I have one and three fourths cup of flour. Now I like using good flour and I support local businesses near my area. So I got Barton Springs Mills flour and it's a very, very high quality grain. So I just wanted to make sure I got that one. Shout out for them because it's fantastic. It makes great pizzas and breads. Mix it together because it's so much easier to make sure everything is uniform when we're mixing together in a pan without any liquid. If we tried to mix everything together and then not do it in the proper steps, it would be very, very gross because you would have lumpy, gross, nasty onions. But we want light, fluffy, airy, and flavorful onions. So for our dry mix, we have one teaspoon of cinnamon, we have one teaspoon of baking powder, a pinch of salt, and then we have the sugar. So we're gonna add the rest of this sugar to it. And I'll make sure you guys have all of the measurements because it's a very precise recipe. No worries. Okay. Well, once we're done with this, what we can do is start to finish the rest of the wet ingredients. Now we want to use half and half for this recipe. It fortifies it with protein. It makes it so that it's going to have enough fat to make it so it's flavorful and delicious. But go ahead and just add all of it to it. What we just did is we're going to add our half and half to this, but we only want to add about a cup. Okay. It's kind of important that we keep the moisture the way it's supposed to be because otherwise the beignets won't taste very good. So we pour it into this and we just slowly mix. When we're mixing our wet ingredients to our dry ingredients, with beignets in particular, you can always just slowly add it to it. I mean, a little bit of gluten development is not going to hurt this recipe at all. Okay, but just going by how it looks, because we want a certain consistency with it, you can tell that it's too dry because it has flour all over the place. We could just add a little bit more of this mixture and then continue to stir. But we want to have it so it flows a little bit, right? And then we also make it so that it's going to have enough moisture to withstand the 375 degree oil that we're about to put it into. So I want to make sure it's nice and homogenous. I'm trying to get underneath it so I'm not getting any surprises later when I'm trying to make this. So to make the Savion sauce, it's going to require a little bit of skill on your part, but I think that you can do this, okay? I believe in you. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to set ourselves up for success with a little towel right here, okay? And then we're going to take another bowl and we're going to set it right here. This is going to insulate 
this bottom of this bowl so we don't curdle our yolks, okay? Now the first thing that we're gonna wanna do is mix our yolks and our sugar, okay? To make a sabayon, we wanna add the egg yolks and the sugar together, and we don't want it to get too hot, so we're mixing it together with the sugar because what that's gonna do is it's gonna allow it to accept more heat and it's just gonna slow that process of the cooking down. Now what makes the on special is we're trying to keep it at a temperature of 181 degrees, at least lower than that, okay? That's when the proteins inside the yolks are gonna start to curdle and you're gonna get scrambled eggs. We don't want this, we're gonna try to keep it below. So don't be afraid to take this off the pot. Like if you feel it's getting too hot, take it off the pot, all right? Now, I like to angle it just like what we did with the, the emulsion blender. So angle it to the side right here. Now I'm gonna have to do this because I'm right-handed, but I have to turn to the side right here. But we're gonna be able to show you exactly what we're doing, okay? So as we're mixing it like this, you're gonna notice that it's starting to look a little bit like ribbons. Okay, what we're doing is we're putting air into the egg yolks and it's gonna start to lighten that. So we're gonna do this until it starts getting to the ribbon stage. And then I'm gonna take the Gar Grand Marnier that I have, and that's gonna become the flavorful agent of this component of this dish. It's gonna make it so that it's nice and light, but it's got richness to it, and it's gonna coat our beignets really nice. Now, if you can tell, right now, the, the Sauvignon is starting to come together, which is nice. Um, it's got a nice white, it's white, or a pale yellow color, almost golden, but not crazy golden. So we're gonna let it keep going, and we're just gonna do this until it gets super, super ribbony. And we're almost at that stage right now. It does require a little bit of strength and patience, but you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Come on, you got this. So this is when we would add our Garmonier, and we don't want it on the heat while we're doing this, or while we're waiting for it. Now this is an alcoholic sauce, so you can skip this if you don't want it, it's perfectly fine. You can use like a, a, a low alcohol wine. Now we like to drizzle this slowly into this sauce, okay? All we're trying to do is keep the emulsion of the fats and the sugar and the fortified alcohol to make it so that we keep this ribbony consistency, okay? Now the more that we cook this, the more ribbony it's gonna get. And the hotter it gets, the thicker the sauce is gonna be. But remember, angle that pan. Make sure that you get all of, as many times of this whisk into it as possible. I can already see that it's starting to thicken and it looks really nice. All right, so I think you can actually stop with the alcohol. We're gonna wanna give it a little taste. We don't wanna go too overboard, okay? It depends on the eggs you get. Because some eggs are bigger, right? So if I say three egg yolks, how are you gonna know how big they are? I'd use extra large eggs, just make it easy. Excellent. So we turn off the heat. We're not gonna set fire to our towel. That's because we were safe and careful. And now, we're gonna be able to turn over and then start frying our beignets. Okay, so frying beignets, hot oil, lots of kids running around the house. This is when I wanna kinda of shut the door or put like some sort of safety cage. I don't want my kids having to experience anything like that before and it's really scary. This has been preheating so it's gonna be a little bit hot. I recommend that you use something to make it so that you're not gonna hurt yourself. Now, I like to use this little thermometer gun. I can see exactly what temperature it is. And we're looking for 350 to 365 degrees. We're right at 355, so that should be fine. Now, if you guys don't have one of these, I highly recommend investing in one. You can go to a restaurant supply store and you can find this for less than $8. But this is a tablespoon measure, and it's gonna make it so much easier to make any kind of beignet, okay? So what we wanna do is get a nice scoop of this beignet batter. We don't want it to be too full though, okay? Because if it's too big, the beignets won't fry well, okay? So you see how easy that was to take that out of this? Look at that, we're gonna have beautiful beignets. All we have to do is wait now. This is the easy part. You did all the hard work already, you know? So now, I like to fry somewhere around like eight or 10. Should be good. Now these do take a moment to cook, and this particular size of this beignet, it can go from eight minutes to 12 minutes, but we're gonna show you a trick to find out if the beignet has been cooked all the way, okay? Because these ones are a different kind of beignet. These are not yeast beignets, or they don't have yeast inside them, so we're using uh, baking powder. So it's more of a quick breath. And when you start to see that it's getting a little bit too much color, you just give it a little flip, like this. It's like frying a donut, okay? And you can keep flipping it as the process continues 
and this way you get a nice uniform color and it's cooked all the way on both sides okay so we're gonna give this the time and then we're gonna come right back to it when I show you when it's ready to be taken off all right, so we're back. We're looking at the beignets. They are turning into this beautiful golden brown. They're flipping themselves as though they're getting ready to turn, but we want to make sure that they're ready, right? Because these are super cute, but it's a circle, and circles don't cook very evenly sometimes. So just to make sure that it is, we are going to pray and say, thank you so much for your sacrifice, and we're gonna stab right into this guy. Now, when you pull it out and you see any kind of batter, it's gotta go back in, okay? It should come out clean, but it's almost done. So we're just gonna give it another minute, and it's gonna be finished. So then when these are finished, we want to put them onto a stainless steel sheet pan with a rack. But I like to have some paper towels underneath it on purpose because it's going to help absorb some extra oil from it. They're just going to drip down. We want to get as much oil out of the beignet because it's going to keep it nice and crispy and fresh. And it's just going to last a lot longer. You're, they're not going to last long, though, guys, seriously. Like these things disappear in my house. Oh my goodness, that was so easy. Look at that, isn't that great? And then now we can just say, hey, the beignets are finished, right? They definitely look like they're finished. I'm gonna take them all out at the same time. If we have to put them back in, we can put them back in. That's not gonna be a big deal. Okay, there we go. These look like cute little hush puppies. They're fantastic. I love them. I like to hey, take at least one of these beignets, cut it open, and just make sure that it's completely finished. Because if you don't feel like it's safe, you just want to make sure, right? I like to double check. I don't have a problem with it. But when you do and it looks like it's a nice bread inside of it, you're done, it's finished, you can turn off your heat. And I highly recommend that you skip into the habit of doing this because this is a safety feature. Either it's a safety thing. This is super hot. If you spill this or if anybody touches this, it is gonna be a really bad day. So we don't wanna mess around with that. I like to push this as far away from the counter as possible. If I have kids running around, I am not gonna let that happen at all, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our now finished beignets and we're gonna show you how we do the plate, okay? Now we're gonna plate our beignets and I'm so excited for you guys to try this. This is one of my favorite recipes. It's so simple, it's so easy. The really, the only hard part was making this up, but it just makes you a better, the better, the more you do it, you know? So what I like to do is we take our super hot beignets and we put it into a really pretty container or a nice bowl and we wanna kind of mound it up, right? So what we're trying to do is build height. Look at that, it looks good. Now here's a, one of my super secrets. We have a sieve, okay? We wanna make sure that it, we get the powdered sugar on top of it, and then when we take it, we're gonna shake it inside this pan a little bit, okay? And then we're gonna put it on top of the beignets, just like this. It gets all over the place, it's all good. You know why? Because it needs the sugar, and it looks nice. Okay, so then, that's finished, and then we have the sabayon sauce that we just got done making. It's super simple, easy recipe, anybody can do it, and I think everybody should try to do it. It's just a taste of Louisiana, which is a little twist on it. So we got blueberry, and then we have a lemon egg sauce. Now this thing is gonna be really strong, and I think you're gonna enjoy it, but remember when you're taking your beignets, the coolest part about it is when you take your beignet and you dip it into this sauce. Get a nice coating, and it's just gonna look really delicious. I think you guys are gonna enjoy it. Hi there, thank you so much for joining us on this episode where we got to explore Oysters Rockefeller, we got to go to Lake Ponch Train with the redfish dish, and then we also got to go to the French Quarter and a little bit of a twist with blueberry and lemon. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys on the next episode, and I hope that you guys enjoy this meal with your friends and family. But remember, keep occasion.